Hi, I'm Kristen Goodwin. On this episode of the Fox News Rundown, it was a fiery Democratic presidential debate on Wednesday. Former Obama White House economic advisor Robert Wolf and Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary under President George W. Bush, join host Lisa Brady to preview the upcoming Nevada caucus. They'll weigh in on which contenders need a big day to stay alive in the race to the White House and whether a divided Democratic Party only helps President Trump. Saturday marks the 40th anniversary of an iconic moment in sports history. The U.S. men's Olympic hockey team defeating the Soviet Union in the 1980 Winter Games. The team captain, Michael Ruzioni, joins the rundown to discuss why the miracle on ice still means so much to so many Americans. Plus commentary from Fox News Sunday host, Chris Wallace. The Fox News Rundown is a daily news podcast where we take a deeper look at the stories important to you. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast player by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. I'm Shannon Bream. I'm Tom Shalou. I'm Maria Bartiromo, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, February 21st, 2020. I'm Lisa Brady. It's Nevada's turn on the presidential calendar. But will the caucus this weekend answer any questions for a divided Democratic Party? The more people that enter Super Tuesday with a chance to get 15 percent, the more probability is we're going to a contested convention. I'm Dave Anthony. Do you believe in miracles? Tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of an iconic moment in sports when the U.S. upset the Soviets in the Olympics. To us, it was a hockey game, but to a lot of people in this country, it was more about we showed the world that, what, you know, what makes this country so great. And I'm Chris Wallace. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. Most of the Democrats running for president are now hunkered down in Nevada, fighting for delegates in Saturday's caucuses, the third vote on the 2020 calendar. And it comes just a few days after a bruising showdown, especially for debate newcomer Mike Bloomberg. Look, the real winner in the debate last night was Donald Trump. Bloomberg isn't on the ballot in Nevada. He held a rally Thursday in Salt Lake City. I worry that we may very well be on the way to nominating somebody who cannot win in November. And if we choose a candidate who appeals to a small base like Senator Sanders, it will be a fatal error. The former New York mayor is sticking to his strategy of skipping the first four contests to focus on Super Tuesday. He had been rising in the polls, driven by heavy spending on campaign ads. It's not clear yet how much that could suffer from Wednesday's debate performance. It's clear that Mayor Bloomberg was everyone's target. Robert Wolf is a former economic advisor to President Obama, now CEO of the advisory firm 32 Advisors, and a Fox News contributor. He seemed to be ill-prepared, which for someone that has known the mayor you know, or Mike for over 30 years and was there with him from Solomon Brothers and has been with him many times from then on. He's someone that you think preparation first. That's just kind of how you think of him. He's an analytical guy. He's a data guy. And he was clearly frozen on stage. The minute, you know, Bernie went after him, but then Elizabeth Warren came after him hard on race and misogyny and everything else. It was like, wow. And he was, it seemed ill-prepared. Warren seemed more like the candidate who had been surging last fall. She just seemed, you know, more fiery again, sharper again. Um, But it's hard to know how much a good debate performance can help. It certainly helped Amy Klobuchar before the New Hampshire primary. But I guess it remains to be seen what happens Saturday in Nevada. Yeah. I, I think Elizabeth Warren, it was an important night for for a few different reasons. One, my guess is the um, the, the viewership's going to be high because Mayor Bloomberg was the first time on stage. So that's always a good thing. You get the airways for free. Number two, she did good fundraising after. She was strong in her numbers. Number three, she disappointed in Iowa in New Hampshire versus her expectations. So this gets her back in the game, gets a buzz again. What happened in the fall that you mentioned when she was kind of looked like she was going to be the lead candidate, she really struggled to discuss where she was on Medicare for All, and she pivoted multiple times, and she really didn't wasn't able to hold the lead. Listen, she's incredibly smart. She has a lot of policies that make sense, and I think she tried to go too far left early on and wasn't comfortable there. 
And I think she's probably in a better place where she is now, where she can be someone who believes she's a capitalist but wants hard regulatory regime kind of surrounding it. Some things haven't changed, though. She seemed to get herself in trouble when she then pivoted and tried to explain her health care plan in more detail. And people were not happy with the num- with the actual numbers. And that that hasn't changed. The plan hasn't changed. Yeah, Lisa, you're right. I mean, one, I am not for Medicare for all. I am for health care as a right. But I'm for someone that you can keep your private insurance, but we should extend the public option. So there should be no uninsured, and those with preconditions should be able to get health care. I think she has struggled with it, and that has been, um, you know, that has been in many ways her her biggest issue because health care is a major topic for everybody, and she kind of goes all over the place. On the flip side, you know, Bernie Sanders has not had to explain himself. He has not been able to say how he pays for it, which is why I think Joe Biden actually, when it came to health care, I actually think he was the best. And I think that that's a good sign for him. He needs momentum. He needs to come in top three in Nevada. He wins, needs to win South Carolina. So he has some strength going in Super Tuesday. In Nevada, the union vote can be a big deal, and it's certainly a more diverse electorate than Iowa and New Hampshire. So does Joe Biden still make it to South Carolina if he does very poorly in Nevada? I think he's going to South Carolina no matter where he comes in Nevada. Um, Nevada. We always have a debate how you say it, so I'll say Nevada. Um, My gut tells me he's going to be top three in Nevada, and there's a chance he outperforms. I think either way, I don't think anyone's going to be at north of 30 percent in Nevada. I just don't think it's going to happen. So I think we're going to go back. I mean, Lisa, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. Iowa. In 2008, Obama was at 40 percent. Edwards and Clinton were each at 30 percent. In 2016, Hillary and Bernie were each near 50 percent. We didn't have anyone north of 25 percent. We go to New Hampshire in 2008. We had three candidates north of 30 percent. We had two candidates, one at 60-something percent, one at 30-plus percent. We had no one at 25 percent, again, in New Hampshire for the most part, and no one near 30 percent. So it's not like when we talk front-runner status, it's not as if we're talking about anyone north of 25 percent. We're talking about six candidates between 10 and 25 percent. Probably good for Mike Bloomberg that he's not on the ballot in in Nevada and, and Tom Steyer— Another billionaire in the race is on the ballot, but he wasn't on the debate stage. Um, But, you know, I guess maybe that gives Bloomberg more time to try to recover from the debate performance. I mean, he hadn't had a debate in 11 years, to be fair. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I would respectfully disagree with that. I think that if you want to be president of the United States, put your hat in the ring and go for it. I think he would have been better off if he's part of Nevada and South Carolina. Because the one reason is he would knock other people out of going into Super Tuesday. So the more people that enter Super Tuesday with a chance to get 15 percent, the more probability is we're going to a contested convention. Do you have any gut feelings at this point about an eventual nominee? I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm a math guy. My background is Wall Street. You know, um, I went to Wharton, so I've always been more analytical and I'm struggling to figure out how anyone can get the number of delegates to be the nominee if we have a half a dozen people staying in the race for a very long time. And if I was running a campaign, I would tell those people to stay in the race and try to collect delegates because you become an incredible power broker uh, this summer in Milwaukee by having delegates. And we don't know who the candidate's going to be. Eventually, there will be a nominee. I think this race is going to be close in November, no matter who the president's opponent is. Ari Fleischer is also a Fox News contributor and former White House press secretary to President George W. Bush. I think Bernie is likely the easiest opponent the president will have to defeat. But whoever the Democrats put up has a chance of winning the White House, including Bernie. And that's because America is so divided. Whoever the Democrat is is going to start with 47, 48 percent of the vote. And that's just the reality of America today. What do you think of the president's strategy holding rallies um, basically on the eve of the contest, the early contest? He had a you know big rally on the eve of the primary in New Hampshire. He's going to have another one on the eve of this weekend's caucuses in Nevada. I mean, he certainly is not sounding 
like someone who's anything less than confident. Our poll numbers are higher today than they've ever been before. Although I guess that could just be the image that he's trying to project. You've got people waiting for hours and hours to get into these events with him as, you know, his fervent, most fervent supporters have always done. Um, is there a danger, though, of being overconfident? Oh, I don't look at this as overconfidence. I look at this as, number one, real smart politics, and two, a whole lot of fun. You know, why, why, when you're a voter in the state of New Hampshire or Iowa, should only Democrats get to engage in politics? You know, Republicans are sitting there going, we've got our guy, we've got our candidate, and they love it when he shows up. So it's good for the president's team to test their organizational machinery and delivering gigantic crowds when people are really watching and paying attention. It's just a smart electoral thing to do. He did run on draining the swamp, though, and it could be argued um, that several of the pardons and commutations announced this week, in addition to some of his other post-impeachment behavior, um, you know, ousting officials that testified against him during the House hearings, this kind of thing, um, I don't know. Could that end up feeling kind of like swampy behavior to a voter in, say, Wisconsin? Well, I think that's the case that the Democrats are going to make, but I split that in two. Uh, number one, anybody who works in the White House, whether you're in the National Security Council or in the main part of the White House supporting the president, if you don't believe in the president, don't work there. They shouldn't work there. You are in service to the president. Yes, you represent your country, but you happen to be serving the president. And so if you can't support the president, go back to the Pentagon, go back to the Department of Energy, go back to the State Department or wherever it was that you were detailed from to have the honor of a temporary service at the White House or at the NSC on behalf of the president. And if you leak, if you don't support the president, you don't belong in the White House. So I have no problem with what the president did on that front. With the commutations and the pardons, I, I found a lot of them to be head scratchers. And that's because I'm a law and order guy, and I don't know if 14 years was the right sentence for uh, the governor of Illinois or whether it should have been eight. I'm not smart enough to know what the difference is, but I do question why a president would spend his time trying to figure that out and let a man out of prison who sold the Senate seat. Do you think it's a liability for the president in this election, though, you know, doing things like tweeting about the Roger Stone case, or is that already baked into the cake of how people see him at this point after three years in office. Well, I think that's a good point. It's baked into the cake, but that is a slice of the cake that I've never liked and I speak out against. There's so many good policy things the president has done, but sometimes temperamentally and via Twitter, the president goes too far. And one instance where he has gone too far is weighing in from the White House on an individual or any individual criminal case. And the problem with that, and this is why I objected when Barack Obama did it about Hillary Clinton, and why I objected when Barack Obama did it about the IRS investigation of conservatives, he dismissed Obama did both of those. It was wrong of the president to speak out on a criminal justice matter. Because White Houses inherently politicize what has to be a process where justice is blind. Presidents should not weigh in. Any reflections from a Republican point of view looking at the caucuses in Nevada this weekend? Any predictions on what will happen with the Democrats? Well, I think you've got to say Bernie still is looking good. You know, Bernie is really changing the Democratic Party just as President Trump changed the Republican Party. And Bernie is bringing this enthusiasm, this energy for the wacky principles that he represents, and he represents those principles with an authentic fashion. He is a socialist. He believes in it. He believes in the confiscation of wealth. He believes in nationalizing the health care industry. He believes in the government dictating what can and cannot be done for energy development. It's atrocious, but it's principled. And what we're really seeing is a Democratic Party that is changing before our very eyes, where socialism is now a real-life possibility and attraction for them. You know, when President Trump was making all the news and all the noise, what's gotten lost that's even more important is the lurch leftward inside the Democratic Party. According to Gallup, when Bill Clinton was president, only 25 percent of Democrats self-identified as liberal. Today, it is 51 percent call themselves liberal. In one generation, the liberals have taken over their already liberal party. And that's what we're seeing now with Bernie, and that's why I will not be surprised if Bernie wins Nevada. And certainly Wednesday's debate helped Bernie. Mike Bloomberg bombed. 
all the other Democrats fought and split, and that just keeps Bernie in an elevated plurality status. Ari Fleischer, former White House press secretary for President George W. Bush, also a Fox News contributor. Thanks, as always, for your time. Thank you, Lisa. Good to be with you. This is Chris Wallace with your Fox News commentary coming up. There have been a lot of big games and achievements in sports, but what happened 40 years ago Saturday may top them all. Sports Illustrated called it the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to slow. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. That was Al Michaels' famous call on ABC Sports as Team USA pulled off a huge Olympic upset, beating the Soviet Union 4-3 to in front of American fans going crazy in Lake Placid, New York. And it's hard to believe in this digital day and age, it's a game that wasn't even on live TV. It aired on tape delay. But the whole country celebrated, even people who could care less about hockey. We beat our arch rivals, the Soviets, a team many considered unbeatable in the middle of the Cold War. It's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, you know, you kind of look back on it and realize it was 40 years ago, and sometimes it feels like it was yesterday. Mike Ruzioni was the 1980 U.S. team captain and scored what ended up the game-winning goal in the third period. It's 40 years, and uh, my teammates and I are still around and uh, excited about uh, you know, the anniversary and the celebration. Yeah, big gathering you're going to have together, right? Yeah, we're going to be in Las Vegas. Uh, the Vegas Knights are bringing the team out there for uh, a weekend. Is this the biggest group you've had together in a long time? This is the biggest we've had probably since uh, 2002 when we lit the cauldron in Salt Lake City. So, yeah, this will this will be the biggest of everyone at the same time. You know, we get 10 guys, 12 guys, 14 guys, but never... Never 18. This will be a case of 18. That's a, that's a really nice gathering. I'm sure you're looking forward yes. to it. And I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, when you went back in 2002 and it was, you know, the games in the U.S., what's it like to be in that moment when you light the cauldron? That's the start of the Olympics. I, yeah, I, I think probably the ultimate honor you can give an Olympic athlete, or in our case, an Olympic team. Uh, Muhammad Ali did in Atlanta, Rafer Johnson in Los Angeles. Yeah. And, and they selected us. I remember Mitt Romney called me well in advance saying, look, at hold hold the night of the opening ceremonies you're going to be a part of the of the you know the the event and didn't know the whole team was going to be there till a few days before mm. they decided to bring the whole team in to do it and and that was just uh, you know it was an unbelievable proud moment this was right after 911 this was a very emotional they, they brought the flag in from the world trade center it was a very emotional uh, opening ceremonies, and I, I remember sitting back, and, and uh, the, the whole format's going to be Peekaboo Street and Cami Granado are going to bring the torch up the stairs. Cami, great women's hockey player, and right. Peekaboo, great skier. And Mike, they get to the top, you go out, get the torch, hold it up, then call your teammates. They're going to come from behind the curtain. I said, I can do this. This is, and my heart's pumping like you, you, this is unbelievable. This is going to happen. Just before I go out to Pat, get the torch, Mark Johnson, one of my teammates, taps me on the shoulder and he says, Remember, four billion people are watching. <laughs> he said, Don't drop the torch. I said, I, I said, No, we can do this. And, and we did it and it was, uh, it was incredible. You scored one of the most iconic goals in the history of hockey, one of the most important moments in the history of sports. How. Do you get sick of talking about it? No, I, I I don't think about it that way either. I just I look at it as I you know had an opportunity to help our team and I scored a goal and we ended up winning four to three. Um, I, I never looked. You at hockey it players as... always talk like that. It's <laughs> yeah, always, I, you it's know, always about the team. But... Well, it was if you know if Mark Johnson doesn't score with one second left to go in the in the first period. Oh, how, that was you know, Now we're down two yeah. to one. If Billy Baker doesn't score against Sweden and we lose that game, how, you know what happens after that? So things happen throughout the games. Uh, uh, the word they use now is you know make plays. You, you know teams who win championships make plays, and I think that's what happened for us in 1980. And I was fortunate to to make a play. And you know looking back on it, it's, it's kind of cool to know that uh, you know I had the winning goal against. The Soviets, but you know, other things happened for us to get to that point. It's always ever since Al Michaels. Do you believe in miracles? Right? It's the miracle, the miracle. Does that at all bother you, considering it a miracle? Because you guys believed you could win, so it, it wasn't. You couldn't have thought it's a miracle. No, that, you know, ke- that miracle is a catchy phrase, um, and and it sounds nice, but it, you know, it wasn't a miracle. It wasn't a fluke. We weren't lucky. 
Uh, Craig Patrick, our assistant coach after the Olympics, said it best. He said they deserve what they got. We, you know, we deserve to win that tournament, and we did. Uh, it's funny. I play golf with Al once in a while out in some of the celebrity tournaments, and we're together, and we're walking up a fairway, and sooner or later someone's going to yell, do you believe in miracles? <laughs> yes. Or I'll be walking through an airport, and someone oh. will say, hey, Mike, do you believe in miracles? And I'm like, So maybe okay. that one gets old. Okay. Maybe yeah. that one gets yeah. old. Yeah, but no, you know, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, the miracles happen in, in much more dramatic fashion than, than a hockey game. So, uh it was it was great and, and and a moment that my teammates and I uh, are very proud to have been a part of. Yeah. Bring us back. I know you talk about it all the time, but bring us back t- to that moment. You guys, it's now tied. What is it, about ten minutes or so? Yeah, Mark Johnson scored a, a power play goal to make it uh, three three, and then I got on the ice uh, on a buzzy night to dump the puck in the zone. My line was up next, so I jumped over the boards. And John Harrington went in the corner, fought the Soviet for the puck, kind of chipped it by the Soviet player to Mark Pavlich. Pav got there at the same time with two Soviet players, and he was able to chip it to me coming across the blue line. And I picked the puck up, and there was a defenseman in front of me, and I thought, if he stays, I'm going to use him as a screen. Uh, He stayed, and I had the whole far corner. And if anything, I pulled it just a little because I was going across my body, but got enough of it and found the opening and uh, gave us the lead. When the puck goes in, What's in your mind at that moment? We have the lead. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> yeah, it was 4-3 to three and uh, 10 minutes left to go. And against the Soviets, that 10 minutes against that team, you know, they can score five goals in 10 minutes easily. And they've been averaging eight, nine goals a game. So uh, this made the score 4-3. to three. So we, we just needed to continue to play the way we had been playing. And, and, and we did. In the last 10 minutes of the game, I think the Soviets had maybe six shots on goal and, and three of them were from outside the, the blue line. When... They were in the middle of this game. Did you sense their frustration? I think we sensed it after I made it 4-3 because they started doing things that were uncharacteristic, like dump the puck in the zone. They never did things like that. Um, the fact that they never pulled the goalie at the end was kind of shocking. Uh, and, and maybe looking back, they'd never been behind before, so maybe yeah, that's why. They, they were in an unusual you know, position. So they, they, they did a lot of things that were, again, uncharacteristic of them. You guys are celebrating. You You score. You win the game. You're on American ice. You're having a, it's going haywire over there. Did you ever look over and see that them just standing there looking at this? When I was walking through, skating through the line, shaking hands, uh, it was almost like a disbelief on their face, like what what just happened. I think they were uh, they were stunned. You know, they'd never lost. They hadn't lost in 40, 40 consecutive games. That's they amazing. hadn't lost in Olympics, and they, this was they, this was their fourth possible gold medal in the last few Olympic years. So. Uh, yeah, I think they were uh, they weren't real happy. 1980 was not the first time the U.S. men's hockey team won a gold medal. The Americans also came out on top in the 1960 Winter Olympics, and they also did it on U.S. ice at the games in Squaw Valley in California. Back on this day, February 21st, 60 years ago, they battered Australia 12 to one. It was their second of seven wins in an undefeated Olympics. But that gold medal isn't as revered as Michael Ruzzioni's 1980 squad. Tension with the Soviet Union had gotten even greater. And two days before the U.S. beat the Soviet Union in 1980, a U.S. deadline expired for Soviet troops to pull out of Afghanistan following the Soviets' 1979 invasion. And then soon after, that led the U.S. to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympics in Moscow. And the Soviets retaliated, boycotting the 1984 Summer Games in Los Angeles. To us, it was a hockey game, but to a lot of people in this country, it was more about we showed the world, what, you know, what makes this country so great. Uh, you know, underdogs and, and hardworking kids and uh, came from working class families who went out and did something and shocked the world. And I think, you know, the political climate, as you mentioned, the hostages have been taken, uh, the Soviets' threat of a Cold War, um, you know, Soviets had invaded, invaded Afghanistan, yeah. uh, gas lines, inflation. Um, you know, President Carter gave his big speak up speech about how this country has kind of lost its malaise, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, you, people were looking for a good story, a right. feel good something, and it, and it happened to be us. And, and of all sports, ice hockey. But this, of course, yeah, not the most American sport, but right. but still a big moment. And that's not the end of it. The story doesn't end. You don't get your gold medals after you play the Soviets. You still have to play Finland to win the gold. Right. If we if people didn't know, if we lost our tied Sunday, we could have come in fourth place and, and not even won a medal. So as great as a Soviet victory was, you know, we didn't go to the Olympics to win one game. We went th- with the hope and dream of winning the whole thing, and now we had that opportunity. We had the opportunity to, to play well and, 
and and finish the uh, finish the job. Now, now, how does a team coming off one of the biggest history uh, sports upsets in history prepare for the next one? Saturday's practice might have been the hardest practice we had all year. I remember going in the locker room and the guys were laughing and joking. We were signing sticks and pictures, and Herb came in and just flipped out. Oh wow! Screaming and yelling. Who do you guys think you are? And I'm I'm like, why is he so pissed off? We just beat the Soviets, you know. Have we, us a, like, well, can we celebrate yeah, a little? But what he did, he brought us right back down to earth by skating us that morning. We we skated hard, and he just got that energy out of us. And I, I know we were ready to play Sunday. Matter of fact, after we beat Finland, if there was another game to play, we would have been ready. I mean, that's just the type of team team that we had. Players that just love to play hockey. Uh, but Herb, Herb got that energy out of us and had us ready to go uh, on, on Sunday. I remember as a nine-year-old kid, hockey player in Connecticut, watching the Finland game on, on that Sunday. Um, that was not an easy game either. No, we, we you know we were trailing again. You know we right. were trailing every game. We were trailing every Olympic game, but against Romania. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're we're trailing two to one going into the third period and. Uh, I remember that locker room like it was yesterday. The atmosphere, Jack O'Callaghan must have said it a hundred times. There's no way a bunch of Finns are keeping us from a gold medal. And the energy was incredible. And Herb walked in the locker room, and that's when he made that famous speech. He pointed his finger and he said, if you lose this game, you'll take it to your grave. Then he walked out, he stopped at the door, he pointed his finger back at us, and he said, your grave, and walked out. Of course, there were a couple of words in, in front of <laughs> grave. But he was right. You know, we, To come so far, to work so hard, um, to accomplish so much, to let it slip away, would have stayed with us forever. And we went out, in my opinion, played the best the best 20 minutes of hockey we played all during the Olympics was that third period against Finland. Uh, we scored three goals, we won 4-2, to two, and we win the whole thing. Everybody remembers Jim Craig, your goalie, you know, looking for his looking dad. With, this, with the flag, the yeah. The flag, yeah. I mean, that's that's it's, it's, a, it's an amazing moment and to watch that. I You know, I still have vivid memories of it all. Now, it's a happy ending, like a storybook ending. There have been movies. I think you helped make the first one, right? right the Miracle the on Ice. One, yeah. What do you think of Miracle, the one people know I, the most? I with? thought it was done well. You know, Kurt Russell was brilliant. He was as, good. As Herb. And although in the movie, Herb was a little friendlier. <laughs> Herb was a little more intense. So but, the real Herb Brooks didn't quite, was was harsher than the one in the movie. Oh, yeah. No, it wasn't even close. Yeah. They, I mean, there's a scene in the movie where Kurt smiles. I, I don't ever remember Herb, Herb smiling. Uh <laughs> But I thought the movie was well done. You know, there were some Hollywoodish scenes here and there, but for the most part, they got the story right as far as we won. Now, you wrote a book about it, The Making yes. of a Miracle, the untold story of the captain of the 1980 gold medal winning U.S. Olympic hockey team. Why did it take so long? Well, Neil Baudet, who, who helped, helped write it with me, uh, approached me a couple of years ago about writing a book about the 80 team, you know, 40 years later. And I talked to my teammates, and a bunch of them said, no, I'm not interested. So Neil said, well, what about you? I want, want to write a book. And I went, nah, You're the captain. I don't want to write a book. You scored the big goal. Uh, so I thought about it, and I said, you know what? Let's do it. And the reason I wrote it, and it's in, it's in the book, is uh, I wanted my grandkids to know that Papa did more than play two weeks in Lake Placid. Mike Arruzzioni, big goal scorer in the win over the Soviets. Congratulations on the book, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for, for your help with the book as well. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Download and listen to the Media Buzz Meter with Howard Kurtz. How he picks five stories, most important to the most entertaining, to the buzziest. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com. America is listening to Fox News. And now, some good news with Tanya J. Powers. Man's best friend has a special place in our hearts. Dogs are there for us. They're happy to see us when we walk in the door, and they come in all shapes, sizes, and temperaments. There are dancing dogs, like Snoopy. There are dogs that are there for you when people let you down. Escaping dogs. Who let the dogs out? And then there's Percy. He's a two year old cockapoo who lives in Toronto and he plays games. No, not like fetch. Real games. Percy is the star of an Instagram video that shows him playing a round of the Hasbro game Connect Four with his owner, Sarah Shapiro Ward, who is also a dog trainer. There you go. Choose your piece. 
He picks the red piece. Good boy. You got it. You got it. Yeah, good job. And he puts it in. Nicely done, bud. Nicely done. It's your turn. Gets a little treat between it's pieces. Good, yeah. Good play. Nice move, buddy. She's the yellow piece, he's the red piece, and there are a couple of blocks in there where she doesn't get to go forward. Sarah says it's impressive that Percy's picked up the gist of the game. He's not great with the strategy of winning just yet, but he likes to play and she cheers him on. You can follow his adventures on Instagram at prancing underscore Percy. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Chris Wallace. What's on your mind? Hi, I'm Chris Wallace, anchor of Fox News Sunday. And one of the big stories this week will be that really interesting debate in Nevada on Wednesday night. Uh, these guys just really went after each other. First of all, a not so uh, happy welcome to Mayor Bloomberg to the debate stage. Uh, and then it was very interesting to watch some of the things. Uh, you could see Pete Buttigieg really go after Amy Klobuchar because he, they can't have these two Midwestern centrists, and they're one, they're, one is trying to knock the other out. Uh, the big winner to me was uh, was Bernie Sanders. It seemed to me he did pretty darn well. Uh, he, you know, has been saying the same things. And where attacking Michael Bloomberg for the first time has a lot of residents calling Bernie Sanders a socialist for the 400th time doesn't. Uh, and, and, you know, they I understand the desire to go after Bloomberg because of all the money he's made and, you know, the argument that he bought his way onto the debate stage. But it, you don't do something to try to stop the Bernie train He's going to have an insurmountable lead in the delegates after Super Tuesday, and this thing could be in effect over. So uh, Bernie Sanders is at this point, I mean, if you had to bet, I think you would have to bet that he's going to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. Things could change, Lord knows, but uh, you wouldn't tra trade positions uh, for anybody else at this point. Uh, we'll be talking about all of that on Fox News Sunday. You have been listening to the Fox News Rundown. Stay up to date by subscribing to Fox News Radio's hourly newscast at foxnewspodcasts.com. And for up-to-the-minute news, visit foxnews.com. Download the one, the one with Craig Gutfeld. Jennifer Haramai. Uh, my ex-husband, Neil Haggerty, like, we wrote all the songs together, but then he pieced out and yeah. didn't want anything to do with the mixing. Right. So, you know, you know you're, you're putting stuff in my lap, and you're, you're going to get a little bit of my flavors. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com.